So we returned, well, today we'll begin the reign of Pope Gregory the Fifteenth. But before we go on to that, again, which begins in 1621, so we're well into the 17th century now. Before we begin that, I'd just like to back up a, f a few decades to 1598, uh, the, the year of the, well, does anybody know, 1598, something particular happened that year. Also, we were talking a lot about yesterday about events in the year 1607. Another one of those was one that the bishop brought up yesterday at the meal. I didn't mention it. I forgot to mention it during class, but did anybody catch that? Probably not. The founding of Jamestown also. I hope Americans have at least heard of that. The first successful English uh, colony in Virginia. So. Uh, anyway, 1598 was the year that Henry IV of France published the Edict of Nantes, and that's important. We talked a bit about how he, of course, came to the throne, was reconciled with the church, became a Catholic, and that he gave the church freedom to operate. It's true, uh, but Daras uh, tends, he likes to... Um, put a, so certain things he likes to whitewash, like uh, most popes, you read his accounts of their lives, uh, everything they did wrong, basically, he just skims over, doesn't even mention it. Uh, <laughs> and in a way, it's good that if he does, if he's doing that, if it was done out of uh, piety towards the papacy, but at the same time, the only pope he says really anything bad about ever was Alexander the Sixth. <laughs> the only pope he ever has any uh, single bad word for. So he likes to whitewash things to a degree. And uh, he doesn't, you know, he mentions that Henry IV also gave freedom to the church in France, but he doesn't mention uh, the other uh, aspects of the Edict of Nantes, uh, which were, you know, uh, which was published in 1598. So the reason that he published, uh, well, specifically an edict, uh, was uh, because the Calvinists expressed their dissatisfaction uh, with the king's return to the church by repeated revolts. So I remember he was, we went through all that, he was reconciled to the church. Uh, Calvinist got very upset at that. So in order to settle the religious dissensions at home, within the kingdom, Henry IV published in 1598 this famous Edict of Nantes. By this decree, Catholic worship was restored. So the Mass was permitted again. Um, obviously, the sacraments could be administered. Catholic worship was restored wherever it had been suppressed by the Calvinists, uh, specifically in 300 towns and 1,000 country parishes. And also remember that parishes might have more than one church. A parish was, I mean, today we think of a parish as being one church, all the people who go to Mass in that church, uh, whereas uh, in times past a parish was uh, uh, an area of territory. Parishes would make up a diocese. Uh, you, may have, you may have more than one church in the parish. So uh, 300 towns and 1,000 country parishes, uh, Catholic worship was restored. Uh, Calvinist worship, so their whatever services they would do, uh, was that was prohibited in all Episcopal and Archiepiscopal cities, at the court, at Paris, and within a belt of five miles around the capital, and in a few other places determined by law. So to practice Calvinism became illegal in certain places by this edict. The Calvinists, who now numbered 750 communities, were still, they were actually granted concessions in this. Uh, they obtained, uh, they were granted a freedom of conscience in all of France. In other words, they could hold their heresies without being punished for it. Representation in the parliaments and equal political rights with the Catholics. And the permission of retaining the places of safety which they still held for the next eight years. So obviously any sort of granting of freedom of conscience is not good. 
the end, the most that a state can do is to tolerate the practice of a false religion in order to avoid uh, some greater evil. But you can't have a uh, positive permission for a false religion to practice, only a tolerance. So the edict put an end, for the time, to active hostilities, but could not lead to lasting peace, as the Calvinists retained their garrisoned places of safety and were allowed to form a state within the state. So basically the edict of not good to the extent that it granted freedom to the church, but bad in granting a freedom of, a freedom of conscience to Calvinists. I mean, it might, you know, most you could do is tolerate, tolerate uh, the practice of heresy. All right, so that's the Edict of Nantes. Now move on to Pope Gregory the Fifteenth. Whose dates are February 9th, 1621, to Jan July 8th, 1623. So, short, but not as short as some other reigns we've seen. He succeeded uh, Pope Paul V as I said, in, uh, in February of 1621. Uh, one of his first acts was to raise the bishopric of Paris to the rank of a metropolitan see at the request of King Louis XIII. Remember we mentioned that uh, Henry IV had been assassinated in 1610. Uh, his... Uh, Successor Louis the Thirteenth requests from Pope Gregory the Fifteenth to make Paris into an, uh, a metropolitan see, and the request is granted. Pope Gregory the Fifteenth founded uh, the College of the of the Propaganda, the uh, the Propaganda Fide, and of course today we hear the word propaganda, you think of uh, uh, Nazi propaganda or communist propaganda or. Uh, or basically name any of the major news networks that you can think of today. It's all propaganda. It's not even news anymore. It's just propaganda. Uh, whereas originally propaganda now has a you know, basically now has a very negative connotation. Something you say, oh, that's just propaganda. That means it's bad. That's essentially just lies pushing an agenda. Whereas originally uh, propaganda, being a Latin and gerundive, just means something to be propagated. De propaganda fide. So literally, congregation concerning the uh, I'm sorry, uh, concerning the faith to be propagated. So I don't know if anyone can see that, but that's the spelling of it. So it was a congregation concerning the faith to be propagated, and that was founded in 1622. So again, the origin of the, the, the propaganda fide is to be traced to, or originally and further, uh, uh, earlier on still to Gregory the Thirteenth, uh, in virtue of which a certain number of cardinals were charged with the direction of missions to the East, and catechisms were ordered to be printed in less known languages. So again, the origins, uh, the the ideas behind this formal congregation, going back to Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, you see the kind of work it did. It was all about simply propagating the faith. Uh, it was, uh, didn't have at the time. There was no sense of you know, propaganda that we have today. But the institution, as it was at that time, was. Uh, nearly neither firmly established firmly nor provided with the requisite funds, so it existed more or less at the time, but it was 
Gregory the Fifteenth, who gave it a constitution, uh, contributed the necessary funds from his own uh, from his own resources, his personal resources, private purse, as Darius puts it, and so essentially really increased its capabilities by really really setting it up the way it needed to be set up. And it, and the uh, this congregation, uh, like the college, you know, so the College of the Propaganda, uh, worked exactly for that for you know, centuries. The propagation of the Catholic faith, and continue skipping over some of these. Okay, so yes, the the year uh, which witnessed the really the establishment of the. Uh, of the uh, Congregation de Propaganda Fide, also uh, signaled, was also distinguished by the canonization of four saints, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, Saint Francis Xavier, Saint uh, Teresa of Avila, and Saint Philip Neri. So Pope Gregory XV did all that in the same year. So. So in 1622, canonizations. Saint Ignatius. Saint Teresa. Yes. Yeah, it started out. It, I mean, its uh, very earliest origins can be traced back to Gregory the Thirteenth, and this is we're calling Gregory the Fifteenth right now. Uh, he he set up uh, similar work to be done. Uh, uh, set up a body of people for that work to be done, but it was Gregory the Fifteenth that really built it up into being a, you know, a serious congregation that could do this. That could do this work. On the scale that it needed to, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's essentially the same thing. I mean, it's all for the proper work for the propagation of the faith. I mean, that's pretty broad. But you, know, you see, the earlier the earliest things they started doing were directing uh, missions, uh, east uh, missions in the uh, east, uh, printing catechisms and lesser in the languages. Again, all work for the propagation of the faith. But he really set it up what it needed to be done. But while uh, he was decreeing that uh, public veneration should be paid to the founder of the Jesuits, uh, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, and to his illustrious disciple, Saint Francis Xavier, the Jesuits were being driven from Holland and forbidden to return on pain of being arrested as enemies and being obliged to pay a ransom. So you can see the Jesuits getting themselves kicked out of yet another country, which was, uh, I'll say, hypocritical, given the fact that the Constitution of Holland contained an article granting freedom of conscience to all. So, they, on one hand, they profess this evil principle of freedom of conscience, but then they don't even apply it consistently. That's true, the, the Jesuits always managed to get themselves hated. But on the other hand, again, that, that was all 1622, uh, but on the other hand, the Emperor Ferdinand II, who is now the Holy Roman Emperor, in order to root out heresy from his own states, forbade the exercise of Protestantism at Prague, 
removed its ministers and placed the university in the charge of the Jesuits. And he also, the same emperor, caused the expulsion of Protestant ministers from the rest of Bohemia and from other areas as well in the empire. Uh, so also another thing Pope Gregory the Fifteenth brought about, uh, enacted decrees uh, concerning, was the reform of the religious orders in France, and which was requested by Louis the Thirteenth, who had also had the reputation of having been a very pious monarch. Uh, he requested and obtained from the Pope, uh, in order to uh, a, a brief, in order to put an end to the disorders which were scandalizing the faithful. So again, more disciplinary reforms, other decrees. Uh, then also the first half, of the, and we spent so much time talking about conflicts in the church, heresies, clashes, significant clashes with civil powers uh, that uh, we some, sometimes tend to forget that there were, uh, well, you have the canonizations of, of saints that we just mentioned, but sometimes we do have you know, saints who are alive and working in the in uh, areas which were perhaps a little more you know, under control, or uh, area, at least areas that were open to being evangelized. Like you know, at this time, uh, Saint Peter Claver was working in the Indies. Uh, in Spain, uh, Saint Joseph uh, uh, Calasanctius, Saint Joseph Calasanctius was uh, founding the clergy of the pious schools, the Scolarum Piarum, as it was called, that was 1617, had uh, St. Fidelis of Sigmaringen, uh, who was uh, martyred by Calvinists in 1622, also had uh, St. Josephat, who died a martyr in uh, 1623, so you know, at this time, we have Lutheranism continuing to spread. Uh, we have uh, saints giving glory to the church at the same time. Glory to God, of course, and then also illuminating the church by their, uh, edifying the church by their example. In 1604, uh, again, this is a bit... This it was before the reign of Pope Gregory XV, but still in 1604, uh, discalced uh, Carmelite nuns had established themselves in Paris. And a few years later, 1611, uh, discalced uh, Carmelite monks, so uh, uh, male religious of the same order, the same reform, uh, founded a, a house there in 1611. So at the same time, you have heresy spreading, but you also have... Uh, reformed, uh, more strict religious orders uh, also gaining ground in areas that are still tolerating it, <laughs> permitting it, or at least tolerating it, because still, all right, so the, also at this time, you had St. Vincent de Paul, who carried all of his, his apostolate at this time, and then St. Francis de Sales died also, in this period, uh, he had been. Let's see what. Well, he had been born in 1567, and entered the ecclesiastical state at an early age, uh, undertaking and after uh, after his ordination the conversion of the province of Chablais, uh, where his efforts were crowned with success and afterwards placed in the Episcopal See of Geneva, which, remember, was Calvin, uh, John Calvin himself, his headquarters in the, 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 the sort of the capital of Calvinism. Uh, he set up there, and again, he, he went there precisely for the purpose of trying to convert the Calvinists, which was a notoriously difficult task. And it's said that he was he was so successful that it is said. I'm, I'm not sure this this may just be some uh, uh, you know, poetic eloquence, but it's said that when he arrived in Geneva, there were seven Catholics, and when he left, there were only seven Calvinists left. So wh whether that's actually true or not, you'd have to look into it. But 
the point is he did actually convert significant numbers of Calvinists during his time there. And also, uh, to uh, aid that work, Henry the Fourth apparently offered um, uh, a pension of a thousand crowns to Saint Francis de Sales to uh, uh, for him to keep up his uh, his admittedly difficult apostolate there. Not really extraordinarily difficult. Uh, And it was also, apparently at the request of Henry IV, that St. Francis wrote the, in the book uh, Introduction to the Devout Life, which of course has been translated to the language of any person who would want to read it, basically. And even the, it was even circulated among the, among the monarchs of Europe. Apparently, even James I, remember, King of England, who, uh, who is a Protestant uh, entourage, is trying to convince him of how evil Catholics are, uh, taking advantage of the gunpowder plot as, an, as, a, as a means to do that. He received, apparently, a copy of this book, and uh, he read it and then asked, uh, asked his bishops, or Anglican bishops, why they, why they could not write in the same way. <laughs> Shouldn't be able. It shouldn't have been difficult for him to figure that out, but he asked it nevertheless. And he also, I remember, also Saint Francis de Sales wrote a treatise on the love of God. And of course, Saint Francis de Sales worked with Saint uh, Jane Francis de Chantal, who founded the Order of the Visitation. Uh, but St. Francis himself died on the 28th of December, 1622. So another big year, a lot of things happening, <laughs> 1622. All right, now we'll move on to Pope Urban VIII, whose reign is a couple of decades long. Urban the eighth, August sixth. Sixteen twenty three to June twenty ninth, sixteen forty four. Anybody know anything about the date June twenty ninth? That should be an easy one. Anyway, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes, right. Saints Peter and Paul always go together. You may have noticed that. No, I know that every feast of Saint Peter, like Saint the feast of Saint Peter, Saint Peter's chair in Rome, which we just had, is a commemoration of Saint Paul. Yesterday, the feast of the conversion of Saint Paul. There is a commemoration of Saint Peter, and then, but the big feast of Saints Peter and Paul is June 29th. That one has an octave and everything. Maybe sometime we can have, maybe the next pope put one or two more big feasts in June so the whole month can just be octaves. Always got a lot, always a lot of octaves. You have Corpus Christi, St. John, St. Peter and Paul. We've got uh, quite a few around that time. It's also <laughs> it's interesting that uh, the feast of the Queenship of Our Lady was put on May 31st so that there would actually be a feast of Our Lady in the month of May. But usually it gets pushed into June because the octave of Corpus Christi is sometimes, uh, the Corpus Christi many times in, in, in May, and that you can't have a f uh, double of second class inside that octave, so it gets pushed into June most of the time. It's unusual. Oh, well, it's actually in May this year. But there are, you know, May has already so many other feasts. Anyway, uh, Pope Urban VIII. Uh, so he was Cardinal Maf Maffeo Barberini uh, from a family in Florence. He was elected on August 6th, 1623, and took the name Urban VIII. So during this time, there's a lot of 
a lot of things going on. Again, if uh, we f if we finish in with enough time this year, uh, we'll probably go back and cover various events in more detail because remember we're looking at the high points of church history. <laughs> we're not covering nearly all of the secular history that could be covered. We could spend years studying this period uh, and still probably have more to cover. But if we have time, if we cover everything, we have to go still. I've got more than 100 years still to go to cover. Uh, but if we have enough time, we'll cover things in more detail when we finish. So the pontificate of Urban VIII was contemporaneous with a series of events which threatened the peace of Europe. Uh, in France, Louis XIII had entrusted the management of affairs to a man who's uh, <laughs> uh, certainly a good administrator, uh, whose bold and unbending mind was to direct um, everything, basically, that he, uh, yeah, came under his power. Uh, anybody know who this was? It was a cardinal, famous, yeah. Yeah, Cardinal Richelieu, yes. Does anybody know how he would say the office? <laughs> Interesting story. Well, what he would do uh, is he would start, so this is midnight right here, he would start saying his office about 10 p.m. and fit, say his office for that day, and then at midnight, start the office for the next day, say that whole office, then he wouldn't have to say the office again for two days. Not recommended. <laughs> Not recommended. That's not <laughs> what the church intends for saying the office. There's a reason why those are assigned to different hours of the day. It's meant to be split up. But, I mean, it fulfills the obligation. That's how he did it. So, anyway, he was a uh, bishop of Luçon and afterwards a cardinal. Uh, he was, he really ruled, you might say, for a quarter of a century in the name of the king, and did, uh, did a lot to, to prepare the country for the reign of, uh, of Louis XIV. And then in England, James I died and left his throne to Charles I. Anybody remember anything about Charles I? Talked about him yesterday. That should be a hint. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Got his head chopped off. Uh, after he was captured at which battle? I mentioned that yesterday too. Did anybody remember that? You remember it, or you're just nodding that you remember I said something about it? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> the Battle of Naseby. And I, I said I saw that. I visited that battlefield when I was in England around Christmas time, and it looks like a field. <laughs> I mean, you might, you might think of a battlefield being covered in monuments. There's one monument there, but it's still farmland, still functions as farmland, which it was at the time. So it's the reason they call battlefields battlefields, because they always had to uh, choose big, wide open fields in order for the armies to line up and start going at each other. Uh, anyway, Charles I came to power. Uh, in 1625, we established, uh, which inaugurated a reign which was to end on the scaffold. Uh, let's see. Are oh, there other political things going on? Uh, but all of these elements of you know, dissension, pol or political conflicts, uh, which were working uh, in the bosom of European society, combined to bring about the Thirty Years' War, which broke out in Germany, and which Daras says, writing in the 19th century, uh, possessed a character of fierceness and obstinacy without a parallel in history. I think we've surpassed it since then, but at the time it was a huge war. I mean, it was a big war, but it was, you know, it's been been surpassed since then. So the struggle was opened by a revolt of the uh, Bohemian Protestants under the elector Frederick V. That was again 1618. 
so a few years before Pope Urban VIII actually comes to, uh, you know, comes to the, the to the to the papal throne, but still it affects his reign so much. We're talking about it uh, in his reign, in the, beneath the study of his reign. Uh, does anybody remember how how this started? <laughs> so anybody who's uh, ever heard of the 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 the, de uh, the defenestration of Prague? You know what that means? A defenestration is to throw someone out a window. You know, fenestra is a window. Somebody, some people got thrown out of a window, and that's the start of the war. Some, somehow nobody was hurt in that, but some people were thrown out of a, out of a window, and that started the war. Anyway, yes. Oh uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so you're right, <laughs> right. Yes, it's true. They were Protestants with the Catholics out the window. But in any case, that started the war. Uh, I guess somehow nobody was hurt, but still, you know, started a war. I get usually uh, um, uh, uh, something like that is like the spark, the lights, uh, the the fuse that that just that you know, causes the powder keg to explode. Like the uh, any, think of another famous assassination that started a huge war. Anybody else? Any other one from ni 1914? Yeah, yes. Uh, well, you say they try. I, as far as I know, they actually did it. <laughs> yes, uh, gov a Serb named Gavrilo Princip uh, uh, assassinated the. Oh, anybody know his name? Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who was the crown prince of Austria-Hungary. The nephew of anybody know who? <laughs> we know whose whose nephew he was. Or perhaps his son is. I have to, I have to look that up. Actually, it was his nephew or his son? But anyway, he was his heir, the heir of uh, Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria, who reigned for a long time. He was in there for a long time. But does anybody know what year he died? Oh, Nineteen sixteen. <laughs> The same year, actually, as the uh, the assassin who killed Franz Ferdinand. Uh, but in any case, that was essentially he assassinated the Archduke, and then, but it was uh, it was at least a month after that that the war started, supposedly because of that. Then it was a lot of political machination uh, machinations going on uh, before the uh, Austrians used it as an excuse to invade Serbia. Uh, because of which Russia declared war on Austria, uh, Germany declared war on Russia, France declared war on Germany, Germany on France, <laughs> and then the Germans invaded Belgium, so the British declared war on Germany. So it's because of an assassination in Bosnia <laughs> that you know, war started in France. <laughs> so it really it was just a spark that lit the powder keg that was already in place, had been in place for decades by that time. So it's a similar thing here. People getting thrown out of a window, nobody actually dying or even really getting hurt, and then you have 30 years' war following upon it. So uh, the emperor, uh, Frederick II, supported by the Spaniards and the Catholic League of Germany, so there were Catholics who banded together in Germany, even though we think of that as being very closely associated with Lutheranism, or very much the stronghold of Lutheranism. Still, there were enough Catholics there to form a league and they defeated uh, the rebels in battle at Prague. So their leader, Frederick the, the V, <coughs> was the private of his electorate, which the conqueror bestowed upon Maximilian, Duke of Bavaria. So that seemed at first like it was the end. Again, we're going to spend too much time on all of these, uh, the, the political part of the struggle, but still to give some background here. So that seemed like it was it. It seemed to be the end. But in fact, it was only the first stage, and it was called the Palatine War. So the powers of the North took part with the German Protestants. So uh, the King of Denmark, whose who was name was Christian IV, marched against the Emperor. And that phase of the struggle was called the Danish Period. So that was 1624 to 1629. So remember, it was uh, in 1620 that the elector Frederick V lost his, uh, his his electorate. The elector lost his electorate, 
in that year, but then it was 1624 to 1629 that you have the uh, called the uh, what do you call it the the Danish period. So this is the And it was followed by a Swedish period, and then Cardinal Richelieu got involved, and that opened the French period, which was in the 1630s and 40s. In fact, it, that, that particular period was from 1635 to 1648. So you see it all began in 1618, 1620, and lasted until about 1648, so that is approximately 30 years. And so Dara says that it does not enter into the scope of our work to give a detailed account of the events which belong to the political history of Europe. So if Daras is saying that, we, that this is too much detail to go into here in political matters, then there definitely is too much detail to go into in political matters because he likes to talk about that sort of thing a lot, uh, usually regarding the Holy See and the little Italian states, but he does like to talk about that a lot. Um, but again, this is something we, we could potentially come back to later. Uh, many of a long list of events we could come back to. But again, suffice it to say that it began on religious grounds, the Thirty Years' War began on religious grounds, but was not carried out on any determined plan, nor for the particular end for which it had been undertaken. So basically everybody was fighting, but nobody had really <laughs> a strong idea of what exactly we're hoping to effect by all of this. And probably nobody at the beginning even foresaw that it would you know, spark a series of struggles lasting 30 years. Uh, in fact, uh, interesting, Madara says that no man, or uh, uh, from all directions and on all occasions, it was constantly receiving new elements of agitation and revenge. Every personal enmity, every political altercation, was merged into this great quarrel, and never was the truth of the axiom more truly demonstrated that war is fed by war. It's true. Uh, authors talking about other, other large wars have said the same thing. That, it's, for example, going back to the First World War, that the there were attempts to bring about an end to it earlier on in its earlier years, but by that time everybody had essentially spent so much blood and treasure in the war or on it that uh, everybody said, well, we have to win something now, we have to come out of this with some extra territory or something to have something to show for the you know, amount of blood we've shed and the amount of treasure we've spent on this conflict. So as you know, they get more deeply involved, the less anybody wants to bring about any sort of a compromise. Everybody becomes more and more committed to actually winning. So I do have a similar thing here. People get more and more deeply involved and less willing to have any sort of peace. So uh, at this time, so now we're going to the year 1627, uh, the Duke of Buckingham was sent by uh, Charles the First, uh, who was himself a, a Protestant, <coughs> to um, or he tried to prepare an invasion force to help the French Calvinists. Uh, so he appeared off the uh, coast, the west uh, coast of France, with a large fleet, and uh, the. So, long story short, the Huguenots, remember, anybody remember who the Huguenots are? <laughs> that sound familiar? Yes. Yes, the French Calvinists, French Protestants, uh, were soon uh, armed to second this movement in their favor. So, again, <laughs> they've had, so the, the, you know, the, they're still not happy with, or content with their concessions from the Edict of Nantes. 
although the center of their power is uh, La Rochelle, a city again on the west coast of France, which had been granted to them by the Edict of Nantes. They were allowed to keep that, although this seems to be far more than eight years after <laughs> the uh, uh, the treaty. They were allowed to keep their safe their safe havens for eight years. They held on to this one, whether be whether due to uh, an amendment of the edict or they just kept it. I don't know, though it would not be difficult to believe that they just kept it. Uh, but Cardinal Richelieu uh, took the city in October of 1628. So the Huguenots were obliged uh, after that to receive terms. So they had to uh, they had to have their terms of peace dictated to them. Yes. Oh, Cardinal Richelieu. Oh, it was actually Cardinal Cardinal Richelieu. But, uh, We heard a lot about him a few years ago when we had the reading, the, the reading of the book in the refectory about the North American martyrs, mostly focused on Saint Jean de Blaisbleuf, but talking about some of the others as well, he came up quite a bit in that, uh, because again they're also figured into a lot of what the missionaries were able to do, where they were able to go, whether they were able to get resources or not, depended on the political struggles that France was undergoing at the time and Cardinal Richelieu that was in control of things at the time. So there was a lot of talk of getting to Cardinal Richelieu to get the resources that they needed to carry out their mission work, missionary work. And also there, in, so in connection with that, there was a lot of um, essentially pirate activity going on on the part of the English. They were raiding you know, French settlements, needing to get a return for their investors. <laughs> that was a big deal. Uh, that's why um, the famous, essentially pirate, uh, Francis Drake, who was actually knighted by Queen Elizabeth, uh, Queen Elizabeth I, uh, of course, uh, was you know, Sir Francis Drake. Uh, he was uh, so popular was because he was extremely successful, looted all of these Spanish treasure ships, and came back with an e absolutely enormous return <laughs> for his investors. So they liked him a lot for that. He even got knighted and so forth. But... Uh, similar thing, but anyway, that's again, that's going more into secular history. It's interesting, but we don't have the time to cover all of it. So Richelieu had basically broken the power of the Huguenots. I mean, they were still there, but they they were not the the power that they had once been. Uh, of course. The Thirty Years' War ended with what? Does anybody remember? Very famous treaty. That's a hint. <laughs> yes. Yes, treaty. Right. Treaty of Westphalia. Yes, also it's called the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. And let's see, has anybody here taken the historical part of modern errors? Of course, yeah, anybody else? No. Oh, you have to. Yeah. Okay. So some some of you may have taken that. But in any case, we covered that in there a bit. So this might. Anybody who took that class would be a bit of a review, but it's from a slightly different angle. So the the treaty, some of you might see it, also called the Peace of Westphalia. And did the Thirty Years' War. And again, it essentially again we don't need to go into all of the all of the details of it, but we'll actually we'll see it a, we'll see it more a bit later. Uh, because remember, that's actually a few years after the end of the reign of, of Pope Urban VIII. He died in 1644. The treaty was in 1648. So we'll get to that later, but we'll see it again. Just keep that in mind there. So while the political world was resounding with the clash of arms. Uh, a new struggle was shaking the religious world and was gradually assuming the character of a heresy. 
uh, more dangerous in proportion as its partisans pretended to remain in close communion with the center of unity. So, and like much like modernists, the other sects uh, openly professed their contempt for ecclesiastical authority. Think Luther, Calvin, Zwingli. All of them gloried in having broken the bonds which held them to to the Roman See, to the Holy See, whereas the Jansenists, and it's the Jansenists that we're now talking about, on the contrary, wished to be of the church, in spite of the church, and would never acknowledge that they had separated themselves from it. So now we're covering Jansenism, or, or start seeing the beginnings of it anyway. Jansenism. Uh, let's see. So the name of the reason just called Jansenism is because uh, it was uh, the first one to come up with these errors was Cor Cornelius Jansenius or Jansenius, uh, who was born in Holland, which in fi 1585, which we joke is the at the the hell section of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> you read about it, it's one of those places. Like, the Jesuits got expelled from everywhere. All these, uh, basically all horrible people all spent time in Holland at one time or another for some reason. Uh, then, so he was born in Holland. He began his studies at Utrecht and finished them in the University of Louvain. Remember, Louvain is also associated with some other, say, we'll call it a theological movement. Anybody know <laughs> what that was? We spent that. Yes, the the, the nouvelle theologie, the new theology, basically the resurgence of modernism in the in the twentieth century. So uh, we've seen it uh, before, but it's with Jansenism that that Louvain, it's sort of its reputation begins to be associated very strongly with, we'll say, problems. So he studied uh, under the nephew of the famous uh, Michael Bayus. And and another another student who both of whom were zealous propagators of Bayanism. Again, we're not going to cover the errors of Michael Bias that belongs to uh, dogmatic theology. But suffice it to say that uh, the young student uh, Cornelius Jansenius was much taken up by with the question of grace, which was then discussed in all the schools. And he's supposed to have read the works of St. Augustine ten times successively and summed up the fruit of his reading in an enormous volume which he published under the title of Augustinus after his promotion to the bishopric of Ypres. Does anybody know how to spell that word, Ypres? <laughs> See, it's um, very famous for, we keep going back to the First World War today, very famous for multiple battles during the First World War, but it's spelled like that, pronounced Ypres. But when English soldiers marched into the town during the war, they called it wipers. They couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't pronounce that, so they called it wipers. That's true. Okay, well, we'll go come back to, we're just getting off the ground here with Jansenism.